Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Summit Youth Awards Gala. Please welcome on stage Miss Sunkendalin Owaja from Nigeria and Mr. Anshul Tawari from India. Hello everyone and welcome to the beautiful city of Graz for the main gala of the World Summit Youth Award 2012. 2011. <laughs> Anshul is in the future. I'm in Kem Dilim. <laughs> and I'm Anshul Tiwari. And we will be your hosts tonight. We want to welcome you here to acknowledge the amazing projects that have been using ITC, ICT for furthering the Millennium Development Goals. Most of you already know us, but those who don't, let's quickly introduce ourselves. As I said, my name is in Kem Dilim and I traveled all the way from Lagos in Nigeria to be here tonight and honor the winners. I run an ICT company in Nigeria, to be more specific, a software company. And um, I got involved with the World Summit Youth Award in 2008 when I was invited to Ghana by one of the World Summit Award board members, Ms. Dorothy Gordon, and I met Professor Brooke there. And, you know, we started talking and he told me about this amazing project and I was really, really interested. And when he asked me to be part of the jury in 2009, I was honored beyond measure. I cannot even tell you how much. And since then I have been on the jury and now I've actually been promoted to being a board member. And, you know, as a producer and um, programmer, I can, you know, just not even put into words how excited I am tonight. You know, because there is hardly a day where you get recognition for what you do. The projects that we see here tonight, it's not only internet e-content, there are applications, mobile apps, all sorts. And they're not only pieces of software, but they do something good. And that is something that I think is absolutely amazing. And I travel from New Delhi, India, and run an organization called Youth Key Avaz which is one of India's largest online platform for young people to express themselves on various issues. Um, I was also one of the winners of the World Summit Youth Award in 2010 for the category Education for All. It was a fantastic experience being in New York last year uh, for the award function. And I was really excited when I got to know that I'm also on the jury of the 2011 World Summit Youth Award. And the reason why I'm here is because like Nick Emdelim, I realize that it's really important for young startups and projects that are using new media to further social causes to get recognition, the right kind of recognition in the right way. And I think the first step towards moving forward in the right direction is recognition. And that is why I'm here to support the World Summit Youth Award. Before we start acknowledging all the winners with their beautiful projects, we would like to ask the chairman of the World Summit Youth Award, Professor Peter Brook on stage. Good evening and welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you on the stage here. Both of you, you really epitomize what the World Summit Youth Award is all about. You yourself with the commitment to excellence in technology and creativity, and Anjul also in terms of rolling out the platforms and getting so many young people engaged, not five, not ten, thousands of people in an entire subcontinent. This is an evening of celebration. It's an evening uh, which is very special because uh, it is addressing something which has not happened ever before in human history, which is that entire humankind has not just talked about doing good, not just talked about changing the world, not just bringing about love, and understanding on an abstract or normative way, but that the entire international community came together to vote and to decide on, to benchmark progress on very, very critical dimensions of human development. And that kind of benchmarking of progress is critical to the changes in our world. We are coming here to the city of Graz for the very good reason, because this is a city of human rights, it's a city of hospitality, it's a city of technology, 
It's a city of university and research, and it has been the cultural capital of Europe. And it's my pleasure to say hello to Mr. Pichel Percevic, who is representing the mayor here tonight, to say a couple of words of welcome. Mr. Percevic, are you willing to come onto the stage? You are working on the city council and the city parliament, and you are leading uh, the uh, party of the mayor in the city parliament. And you were also quite influential in getting the city organized and helping the city to create it a UNESCO city of design. What's the vision behind that? At first, uh, let me welcome you on behalf of the city of Graz. It really is a great pleasure for me, together with my colleague of the city parliament, Dominic Neumann, uh, we welcome you on behalf of our mayor. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here. Uh, and by the way, a real congratulation to all the winners and the runners-up. Really, what uh, uh, the host from Nigeria and India expressed, you deserve the recognition for what you did. And what we want to do with having become uh, City of Design, the title from UNESCO, is going further on this the same way. The, to, to network by the means of internet of all the modern ICT devices. But uh, let me say, uh, you never can replace the personal meeting. Keep this, please. Uh, you can improve the contacts afterwards, having met, but uh, you can't replace it. This is our conviction. So uh, we, we, City of Design, we uh, have a, a comparable good and excellent creative industry sector. And uh, with this network of Kobe, Nagoya, Shenzhen, Saint Etienne, Berlin, Buenos Aires, we want to improve uh, uh, the connections in that field of uh, arts and design of creative industry for the benefit of the mankind in the developed countries and in the developing countries. Thank you. I know that uh, in the last two days, through the collaboration which took already place here, many of the things took already place within the lives of the winners here and the runner-ups. And uh, so I can ask you to relate back to the mayor and also the other people in the city parliament that actually the, your hospitality has already had a great impact. So thank you very much again for hosting us here. And stay here with me on the stage. There's, there are many ways how to count human history. One way is to count the number of people who live on this earth. It is a couple of weeks that the counter stopped at seven billion. Seven billion people on this earth means that not all of them are as privileged as we are here tonight, sitting in comfort, knowing that we will be fed, that we have enough clean water. There's 1.2 billion people who do not have sanitary conditions in order to clean themselves properly, give fine water to their children, and get kids to the school. That is the reason why the Millennium Development Goals are so crucial. They are crucial to benchmark the changes which are made by governments, by business, by NGOs, and to give it a drive, and also to recognize when we fail. The person who coordinates this in New York is the person who works very closely with the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and who also works with the United Nations Department of Economic, Social and Affairs. And I ask you to welcome Thomas Stelzer here on the stage. <laughs> My right side is the nice side. <laughs> That's the side, the side in the sum. Thomas Stelzer, you are coordinating uh, the ministers of the United Nations, the 29 principals who come together for the chief executive board, and you organized also the Millennium Review Summit. 
Many people say we will fail with the Millennium Development Goals. What do you actually do to accelerate implementation? Well, first I want to say that uh, we shouldn't overrate the role of the United Nations. You know, uh, many people expect too much of the United Nations. Of course, our comparative advantage is to provide a platform for people and interests to come together. Then they all come together, our 193 member states, they talk to each other uh, at the General Assembly, as you see it, in other fora too, and they become aware of what is the shared interest of everybody. What's the overlap of interest? This is what we call consensus. So what we try to do is help our stakeholders recognize that there is a much more interest, uh, that we share more, int uh, more interests and to to extend this overlap, the consensus, this is the progress in the United Nations. With the, uh, develop, develop, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, we don't implement them. We help governments to implement the Millennium Development Goals. They were formulated in the United Nations, and we are very proud of those goals because they're real contribution of the United Nations to the development debate. Because we introduced, through the goals, the social spectrum, the social agenda into the development debate, which we consider very important. But what we do is we try to share best experiences, lessons which can be applied to many different cases. We try to work out strategies which we make available to governments, but the implementation process lies with the governments afterwards. We just facilitate and support our stakeholders, our governments, and more and more civil society in this process. There are eight development goals. The first one is end poverty and hunger. Second one is universal education. Third one is gender equality. The fourth one is child health. The fifth one is maternal health. The sixth one is combat HIV and AIDS. The seventh is environmental sustainability. The eighth is global partnership. ICT plays a role in all of them. What is the role in your judgment? Well, I think uh, you all have to define this role. It is very clear that well, ICT is the huge accelerator of development today. But uh, I encourage all of you to think what can be your personal contribution and the contribution of your organization to the specific goals. You know, there are hundreds of examples. Uh, where you can link yourself with the goals, and you have to define where you can do that. We, you, within your country, the MDGs, each MDG needs to be implemented in the framework of a society of a country. And as I said before, we made a lot of progress, but progress is very uneven, country-wise, region-wise, MDG-wise. In general, we are lagging behind. On some of the MDGs, the prospects are quite good. We might reach them, like an MDG-1 eradication of extreme poverty. Uh, we are pretty, pretty advanced on access to clean water, but we are very far behind. We are lagging very far behind on many of the others. But what our reports every year do state and prove and define is that we can make progress uh, under three circumstances. Political will, the right strategies, and the financial means to support the processes. Now, we have a lot of political will in many of the countries. There are very serious governments who are very dedicated to account, really accountable to their constituents and who make progress. We have a lot of strategies. You mentioned the, the MDG summit of last year. And if you look at the outcome documents, we have so many strateg strategies which fit every thinkable and possible situation. So there's no shortage of, of, of strategies. What we do need is the financial means to implement the strategies. And this is where we're lagging behind. You know, you have mentioned before this huge gap between commitment and compli compliance with commitments. You know, when we have a summit in New York, the leaders of the world, the heads of state and government, they come to New York and they understand exactly what the shared responsibility implies. But then, of course, you know, realistically, they go back to their countries and they're absorbed in the pro everyday issues and they need guidance of what is important. Uh, where does this guidance come from? It is the politicians who have to establish the frameworks within which we can implement our global goals. And who gives guidance to the politicians? It's those who they are accountable to. It's civil society, it's you, it's the young people, it's the NGOs, it's academia, it's also the business community. 
all those who have longer term thinkings and considerations, terms which go beyond this four year electoral cycles that politicians are normally caught up in. So we can, we can make progress only if we bring all the stakeholders together. And this is why when the Secretary General asked me last year to organize uh, the MDG summit, we made it the first stakeholder summit in the history of the United Nations. We didn't only want to bring up, you know, of course, the United Nations is an intergovernmental organization, it's very clear, and our main clients are governments. But not only, you know, we have recognized in the meantime that the Charter of the United Nations says, doesn't say we the governments of the United Nations, it says we the peoples of the United Nations, which is much, much further. And to the United Nations, and we all have to bring the stakeholders together, all those who have something at stake in an issue, who have an interest, who will develop a shared ownership of a process. You know, if we leave it to the politicians, the achievements of the United Nations become dead wood. Nobody implements them. And we have ample examples of that. To make sure that we implement the, the great success of the MDG summit last year, we really have to go beyond the summit. We have to see what is the outcome, what are the opportunities, and how can we all contribute to implement this, uh, the outcome we have four more years to go, until 2015. Uh, 2050 world will not stop. But the framework now is until 2015. And the question is, how can we all together accelerate implementation of the MDGs from now to 2015? And we have to do it, you know, and we cannot take one of the MDGs out. You know, they're all interlinked. We will not resolve one issue if we don't make progress on the other one. We will not resolve, we will not resolve child mortality without resolving access to sanitation. You know, waterborne diseases are a main reason for child mortality. We will not resolve the education problem without access to sanitation for women, because uh, parents don't send their girls to school if there is no separate bathrooms. You know, we will not resolve uh, MDG1 without creating opportunities, jobs. You have mentioned the population. You tell me when I'm talking too much, okay? Uh, I think, no, no, but, but I think that uh, we, I promised you, you don't have to give a speech. You're giving a speech, but you don't have a script, and therefore you get some applause in between. Let's have applause. <laughs> no. you know. And now you can go on, but I have a question for you still. Okay. You know, we are always very happy in the United Nations when we have an opportunity to talk about what we need to do together. Because, you know, we do, what we do is in mainly two areas, you know, one, and the most important thing is advocacy. Help our stakeholders understand what is in our shared interest. And this is our main issue, because only if we identify issues, we can make progress, we can develop cooperative, comprehensive uh, resolutions. So, uh, the MDGs are all linked together, and to make progress on one, we have to make progress on all of them. So, we have to think in this uh, linked, connected, comprehensive uh, approach uh, on the MDGs. No. Okay, now I have a little quiz for you. What do you think is the difference between Niger in Africa, in the middle of Africa, and Austria in the middle of Europe? Okay, I make it easy for you. In Austria, the median age is 44 years old. In Niger, the median age is 15 years. Which means, if you look at what the median age is at the moment around the world, it's about 28 or 27 years. I venture to suggest to you that the three factors which you have said for success needs to be augmented by a fourth. It's not just to get governments to act and to make politicians work. I think what the United Nations needs to do is to engage youth. And this is what I offer you tonight, is to take back the examples of what young people do, not in terms of strategy, but in terms of action. And I think this will mesmerize this, and I suggest that you and I talk at the end of this evening one more time and continue this conversation. Is this okay with you? Thank you very much, yes, yes. No, it, uh, but I want to say one thing, please. Okay. Uh, I want to congratulate the organizers of this Congress here. You know, the team is very, it's not only active, but it's focused, it's full of enthusiasm and very convincing. 
You know, it was so convincing they had no chance not to be here tonight in spite of my schedule. And I'm very happy to be here with you and sharing this with you and working with you because I really think that young people and engaged people are not only the future of the world, but they are the most important stakeholders for all of us that we make progress together on issues that we share. And they have one more advantage over you and me. They know how to use IT. And that's the reason why we are here. So Nick Handelim and uh, Anju, take it away. Please show us what the projects are. Thank you very much. Thank you. One last point, uh, so that Nick Handelim and Anju are not alone on the stage. I have asked uh, that there is some music. And we have some music from the Massive Beats crew. And for all those who are coming from the Arab countries, uh, they are coming from Salfelden, which is close to Tel Amsee, where everybody goes skiing. And this is, uh, the name is uh, Antonin Walch and Thomas Rieder. Are you here? Where are they? Can you? We are here. Hello. Let, let, let us hear you. Oh, <laughs> 